Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to the Department of Forensic Sciences. My name is Jennifer Smith. And today, I feel very fortunate to welcome the, the mayor and uh, uh, Mayor Bowser and Deputy Ma um, Mayor uh, Donahue here to the department this morning to start their interesting tour today. Um, at the department, we actually have three divisions. If you were on the fourth floor, you would find our public health laboratory up there. They look at samples and test those um, with issues that are of interest to public health issues of the citizens. On our second and third floor, you would find our forensic science laboratory units. There, those labs work the traditional evidence that you're familiar with. Uh, they look at firearms, latent fingerprints, uh, biological and digital evidence. Um, but today, we've asked you to join us here in the basement. And this is because today we want to highlight the third division, our Crime Scene Sciences Group. Um, and in this area, in this garage last year, those individuals processed about 519 vehicles that were involved in some type of uh, violent crime. And you can see some of those vehicles here in the background. And as you can see, we're very full. Uh, right now. So we are here today to talk about this division because the mayor has been very generous through some supplemental funding that allows us to hire additional crime scene scientists. So we hope to hire about 37 additional people this year with the supplemental funding. Um, but as we are doing that, we also want to recognize that we are not the only ones in the city that process crime scenes. We actually uh, work together with specialized officers from the uh, Metropolitan Police Department that have special training in crime scene processing. And we hope to be able to hire some of those officers upon retirement if they would like to come work with us. So today I, I have uh, two other individuals who actually work with the crime scene sciences, I'd like to introduce them to you. This is Grant Greenwald. He's actually a retired officer who's come back to us and is detailed to us from MPD uh, to act as our unit manager. And Stacy Mucci, who is one of our crime scene scientists. Um, and, but before we go on, I'd like the mayor to introduce uh, and come to the podium to discuss um, some very critical legislation uh, that she is proposing. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Smith. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And we would uh, like to welcome you to our Department of Forensic Sciences, that you frequently hear me refer to as the crime lab. And Dr. Smith was uh, very good in describing all the work that they do um, here, which encompasses um, quite a lot that helps keep the district safer and stronger. I think you are aware a few months ago, we rolled out a comprehensive public safety uh, plan for Washington, D.C. Um, and that plan hit on a number of key points that will keep our neighborhoods safer and stronger. First, we highlighted how we need to increase police presence on streets and in communities, especially hard hit by violence. And we have been very focused on uh, five police service areas. We've also been very focused on how to support neighborhoods and residents who have been hardest hit by crime. Uh, and our mini grants program has allowed us to do that. And we're very pleased that the first tranche of funding uh, to grassroots organizations and individuals has, has gone out. Uh, we have also uh, emphasized that we have to get tougher on, relative, on a relatively small number of repeat violent offenders who continue to bring harm to our communities, especially um, with the use of illegal guns. Uh, we have also been focused on how to provide MPD with the tools and resources it needs uh, to protect our neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, we have been able to step up and finally make a down payment on the investments that this relatively new agency needs uh, to be fully functional um, as part of our, our critical public safety safety infrastructure uh, in the district. Uh, so earlier uh, this year, in the fall, you will remember that we moved a supplemental budget focused on uh, funding our Safer and Stronger initiatives. Uh, it, but some of those initiatives, uh, while we have the, the funding secured, we don't have all of the authority secured. So today we're talking about some of the very important uh, parts of that Safer and Stronger uh, legislation. 
We, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have spent this year focused on getting DFS back on track. Um, and uh, we could only do that because of the employees here at DFS being very committed uh, to moving uh, this agency forward. Uh, we're very pleased with the very competent, energetic leadership of Dr. Smith. Um, but I know that I speak for her in saying we couldn't do it without the employees here. And I want to give them a big, big thank Thank you for staying the course and helping us get uh, DFS on track. Uh, in order to do that, though, we know uh, that DFS needs more resources. And in my legislation, uh, we include a, a element uh, called Retired Police Officer Redeployment Amendment. Retired Police Officer Redeployment Amendment. Uh, this will allow veteran MPD crime scene investigators nearing retirement uh, the opportunity to work at DFS without jeopardizing their retirement benefits. Good detective work requires time and resources, but it also requires experience. Uh, when we got this lab, this, this DFS uh, open some, some years ago, the crime scene analysis, I think you all know the history, had always been done um, by MPD. And the crime scene analysis when DFS opened continues to be done um, by a lot of metropolitan police uh, officers. And and, and just like all of the, the rest of the department, many of those officers are nearing retirement. And we want to put every incentive in place to make sure they know that there is a good job here for them right at DFS. We're going to need the council support in giving us the authority to do that. Um, that will help us. We know how important it is to have experience. We know how important it is to be able to turn around quickly. At least we're finding out this year about how turnaround is helping uh, MPD uh, solve more crimes uh, more quickly. Uh, so with that, I want to acknowledge again our employees and ask a couple of them uh, to tell you a little bit about what uh, they do here at DFS. Let me start with Grant. Uh, good morning. Uh, my basic duties right now are procurement and training for the Crime Scene Investigation Division. And that training also includes training some of the newer folks that are coming on board for the Department of Forensic Sciences, the Crime Scene Sciences themselves, uh, scientists themselves. Um, other than that, our street duties were really charged with the responsibility by the citizens of the District of Columbia to respond to the more serious offenses that occur within the confines of our city and process those scenes. So we're talking about documentation of evidence, collection of evidence, um, preservation of evidence, and dissemination of evidence to the individual laboratories for analysis, and then eventually presentment of that evidence into a court of law. So that's basically what we're doing in a nutshell. And uh, let me also introduce Stacy Mucci, who has been a, a crime scene scientist for the last two years. Stacy, tell us about where you came from and what Thank you do. You. Good morning, my name is Stacy Mucci and I'm a forensic scientist here at the Department of Forensic Sciences. I've been employed here for two years and some of my duties include, as Grant mentioned, responding to crime scenes, um, documenting the scenes through photographs and notes, collecting evidence, processing that evidence in a laboratory setting, and um, testifying in court proceedings. Um, prior to my employment here, I actually was a police officer with the Metropolitan Police Department for eight years at the second district. So I feel like my experience as a police officer greatly contributed and helped me transition into this position um, and just being familiar with the city and some of the policies that DFS has adopted during this transition process um, through MPD. Yes. First name is Stacy. S T A C Y. My last name is spelled Mucci. M U C C I. Very good. You're welcome. Okay. 
And uh, I also want to acknowledge our Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, uh, Kevin Donahue is here. And Kevin has an additional duty today. He's the ride-along mayor. Uh, and I think you all know that over the last several months, uh, many agency directors have been spending the entire day with me, um, both so they see the breadth of what uh, the, that I encounter every day, but also I get to pick their brains for eight hours. And that's, that's fun. Uh, so uh, we're happy to take any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am, please identify yourself. Hi, Nicole Rod with WMAL Radio. Can you talk about the importance of not losing that skill set with retired? I can't hear you. Sorry. Can you talk about the importance of not losing that skill set with veteran cops and with Grant? Can you talk about why, why retired policemen would want to continue working? Um, well, thank you for that question. And uh, what we see is that retired police officers continue working all the time. Uh, and we want to make sure that we in the district aren't losing their experience. Uh, uh, police officers uh, qualify for retirement after 25 years of service in the age of 50. Uh, so we expect many officers will go on uh, to a second career. Uh, and it is important that we have the, the full um, spectrum of experience. Uh, Grant has already talked to you about how he's involved in training uh, civilians that come in to do crime scene analysis. And we want to make sure that we, we have the breadth of experience on our team. But let me turn to Dr. Smith to say a little more. Uh, I think one of the things that's very important to consider is it takes about six weeks of in-class training when you start with a, a new person with little experience. We won't need to do that with the officers because they already are coming with that experience. But it's also those intangibles. They know where these areas are. They respond quickly. They can pull from their breadth of experience. If you, uh, Grant can give speeches on all the different crime scenes he's processed, from very small ones to large ones such as the Navy Yard shooting. So that's the type of experience that just cannot be gained except by going out there and doing the work. And what new incentives are you trying to implement to encourage retired police officers to go into forensics? So uh, the question was, what, what it, what's the incentive? Um, the, the, what the legislation would allow us to do is allow a police officer to be hired as a civilian uh, without any um, um, without any negative impact on his or her retirement. And this is all part of the stronger. This is your last question. Okay. okay. Um, this is all part of the stronger, safer legislation that you tried to get passed last year and the council railed against it and it was tabled immediately. What do you think will change this time? I don't think the council railed against it. I think the council just hasn't acted. Uh, and we're calling on them to act on the public safety uh, legislation, um, just like the people of the District of Columbia are. Other questions? Yes, Tom. Uh, Mayor, the Deputy Mayor, may want to answer this. How many police, how many forensic investigators have now, how many would you hire if you had the authority from the council to hire uh, former officers? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Smith to kind of talk about what we need generally here at DFS, um, and specifically um, in, in the crime lab. What we did in the supplemental and what we will do on the F-17 budget will not cover everything that we need. We know that we're going to have to, over a series of years, make the types of investments um, in our operation here to, to be at full steam. TV loves numbers. You have X number now, and you like to have X number in the best world possible. Yeah, so right now we currently have 24 individuals working crime scene in the crime scene sciences unit. Uh, the uh, CSID officers, there are 49 of those officers here. Um, we all have sufficient funding with the supplemental to bring in 37 new DFS employees. But again, as the mayor pointed out, this is going to take us some additional time because we are hoping not only to take on more of the crime scene duties of the CSID officers, but also uh, supplement the efforts that police officers in the districts that are trained as what are called reserve crime scene officers. We'd actually like to get those individuals back full time doing their uh, patrol duties. And so some of these new individuals that we're bringing in will be able to take on some of those duties too. 
Just about how many crime scenes are there every year? It seems like there'd be quite a few from minor ones to big ones. So we actually, uh, last year, the two groups together worked about over 19,000 either crime scenes or requests for some types of services offered by these individuals. So you can see it's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done um, by these people, by all the crime scene folks. And Mayor, if I have my last question. Sure. The overall picture today, you're spending the entire day emphasizing public safety issues. It seems to be a, a, something of a rift between you and the council that it says you're, you're saying it's not acting quickly enough. The council, Mr. McDuffie and others are saying you're not cooperating with them enough, that you're, you need to compromise more like you did with the body cam and that you're not you're making it a political fight rather than a management fight. Uh, well, I don't know who would have said that because we ha introduced a bill in August. Um, there was a marathon hearing in September, uh, and I think that we have we're waiting for somebody to tell us something to react to. Um, so there hasn't, as far as I know, been any, any robust discussion among the council um, following the September hearing, um, and we're in January. There's some really practical things in our legislation. Uh, I know that one of the council members, in fact, doesn't want to wait um, for, for action, and he's moving an element of our bill by emergency tomorrow. Uh, Charles Allen has pulled out a piece of our legislation because I guess he's decided it can't wait anymore. Uh, we have in this legislation uh, the ability to provide rebates to property owners, churches, um, retail establishments, homeowners, uh, for cameras. Um, we know how important video footage is to our investigators in solving crime, and we secured a million dollars for this fiscal year to provide rebates of up to $1,000 for individual property owners. That's in the Safer Stronger legislation, and we're very um, great. And when I go out to community pe meetings, people are asking me about it all the time. So we're very grateful um, to Council Member Allen uh, for moving that uh, by emergency tomorrow. Uh, we're, there are other things that uh, if the council doesn't want to move on a comprehensive piece of legislation, that we would also look to, to get out. A little bit later today, we're going to be at the DC jail uh, talking about uh, many elements that we think can help people get back on the right track. Good time credits would keep people uh, connected to employment as they finish paying their debt uh, to society. There are also elements here that were basically part of what we think you know, could contribute to a climate of hostile relations between police and the community and getting rid of some of those nuisance, uh, what do we call them, uh, evident, uh, reasons for pretextual stops. Uh, and that's in the legislation, and that can move separately. We've also heard from people that they're very concerned, and I've been beating this drum for many months, about crimes in public transit. Uh, as a council member, I moved a piece of legislation that's now in the law that would enhance uh, penalties for crimes against transit operators. And we want to equalize the law so that we also have enhanced penalties for crimes committed uh, for public transit patrons. We have to be clear uh, about, about making, um, making it clear to people that we won't tolerate that type of crime. Mayor, yes? Also, Mayor, the question is, the one I guess is probably most controversial is the, the idea of warrantless searches in the uh, homes of people who, let's say, let parolees live with them or where parolees live. Are you still, still for that? Uh, I, I believe it's important to remove illegal guns um, from our streets, uh, and I also believe that it's important that we hold people accountable who agree uh, as terms of their release um, not to be in possession of illegal guns. Um, but having said that, I want, you know, I'm not, I don't want the whole legislation to be held up because of one controversial element. And so if it, if it moved without it, we would support that because we think that the other elements of the bill are that important. And frankly, I think some members of the council are starting to take that view too. That's why you see one element being moved by emergency tomorrow. The other thing, I wish I'd done my research, but I haven't. But I know that you had problems with this particular lab, it's the, the accuracy of and, and I think you sort of took things out. Where does it stand right now? Are the well, people here doing, doing um, work for the court system? How, where does it stand? Well, let me just tell you, um, actually on the, 
Last year, today, the first Monday after I was sworn in, or the first Tuesday, something like that, uh, we got a letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office saying that uh, they were the, the number one client of the D.C. Crime Lab, that they would no longer use the D.C. Crime Lab to analyze DNA evidence. And so we have spent, and I want to really acknowledge Kevin and his team for being very focused on making sure we get a fresh start here um, at the Crime Lab. And uh, we hired Dr. Smith and a really great team to work with some outstanding employees uh, and we're on track uh, we're on track uh, to to be able to handle DNA evidence at the lab again I don't know if you have anything more specific to say Doc. yes yeah, so the issues mainly involve DNA testing here all other elements uh, were continued to function and no accreditation was lost in any of the other firearms uh, units latent like fingerprints digital evidence all those all that testing uh, continues today, and we are on track to uh, get the DNA unit open here very soon. So it, it, um, so it was a year ago today that the Fed said, uh, the U.S. Attorney said they wouldn't accept the evidence. So how long before you will be able to come back or at least present something to them or whatever? So we are completing all of the training that the analysts have gone through. We've done a lot of validations. We brought on some new methods. Um, and we are right now finalizing all those documents, submitting those to the accreditation group um, for their final reviews. So we're very, very close to op opening them up. know that we have any big and Kevin will be um, even more familiar with uh, the the bill that's the other bill at the council I don't know that we have any major objections uh, to what's included uh, in their bill I think in fact uh, some elements of their bill we already have in motion and don't really require legislative action but let me let me ask Kevin to speak to the specifics um, uh, we, we have no, as the mayor said, we have no major objection. We stated that, I stated that under oath in front of the council months ago. Um, there's three major elements to the, um, to the legislation that uh, Councilman McDuffie put together. Um, one uh, aspect requires additional um, uh, reporting by police of interactions that they have with the public. Um, uh, second uh, puts uh, at uh, emergency rooms uh, social workers. Um, uh, and we have a, a program with our Office of Victim Services to launch exactly such a program in April at MedStar, working with their trauma surgeons. Uh, and a third um, element uh, involves sort of a focused training, life skills, job skills training for uh, individuals who have had interactions with law enforcement. Uh, and we um, uh, took uh, uh, roughly half of the 400 um, career connection slots funded by the Merit Supplemental Bill and specifically asked the supervision agencies to identify individuals who are already under supervision as part of the criminal justice system and prioritize them for life skills and job skills training. So that's the long answer, but the short answer is that uh, at a hearing um, uh, that went well into the night, I'm already on record reflecting the Merit's position that um, we have no major objection. Uh, to the uh, to the proposals in that legislation. Yes, sir. Mayor, go back to the politics of this. The Judiciary Committee and Chairman McDuffie says that the police department has not responded to a lot of data requests that he has, that he hasn't really talked to you since sometime in December. And he said he expected to move some crime legislation this month. And his staff says they're not sure why you're doing this day-long thing today to make it look like the council is not acting. Well, I, I can only refer to uh, the timeline that I started with in, in that we uh, introduced the legislation in September. Uh, there's been a hearing. Uh, I think there have been at least two hearings, actually, before we introduced the legislation uh, and now. And I have frequent conversations with all of the council members. And uh, our expectation is that everybody wants to, to work together um, on, on moving forward. And, and that's what we'll do. So we're, we're talking about public safety. Uh, 
everybody's talking about public safety, and uh, I think it's important that uh, we talk about things that are very important to get moving as soon as possible. Chairman suggests we might move legislation within two weeks, regardless of what you're saying today, that he thinks he'll have it done in two weeks. Okay. And I, have, I have a non. Yes, sir. I have, this is a general question from today. This morning, okay. there was, there was a, a early overnight, there was a police incident downtown, 18th and L in that area. Huge blocking of roadways and traffic uh, on the first day back after the holidays. My editors asked me to ask you about, are police sensitive to the tremendous rush hour in the morning to not cut off all the streets? Right. you've done this morning. Right. Uh, I never like to have streets closed. Um, so and I, probably if you ask any mayor that question, they would say never close the streets. Um, just before the, the holiday, I was in Petworth and there was a fire and Georgia Avenue was closed. The first thing I asked is, when can we get Georgia Avenue open? But it's kind of apropos that we're at the crime lab um, because the reason that it was closed is because they need the crime scene analysis, need some daylight to collect the evidence. Having said that, um, we're, we we want to get the streets open as soon as possible. So, of course, uh, I woke up, watched the news, it's closed. My first question was, when are we going to get, you know, when are we going to get 18th Street back open? Um, and so we want our folks to work and have as much time, but we want them to work quickly uh, so that uh, so that we can get the streets open. Let's open the streets as quickly as possible in any circumstance that you can. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned that you're, you're looking at evolving your views on some of this stuff with the legislation you introduced last August. Did I, did I say that? Yeah, you said, um, you know, if the, if the warrantless searches is going to go separately or taking it out, I'd be okay with that and move everything else That through. doesn't involve evolving my views. My views are the same. Okay. Um, also, the putting more police officers on the street um, has gotten a lot of backlash. David Grosso, for example, said it's the old-fashioned way of doing things, arresting your way out of a problem. The Georgetown, a Georgetown law professor at one of those public hearings testified that it's a short-sighted solution. Um, is that another area that you're willing to negotiate on? Well, it's interesting um, because at the same time, people are, are saying that we need more officers. Uh, and I've, I've been at this a little while and been, as an ANC commissioner, war council member, and quite frankly, I've never been in a neighborhood affected by crime who didn't say they wanted to make sure they had adequate police protection. Um, so we are, we are going to have adequate police protection. Thank you, everybody.